Which will be in uh, Genesis chapter 3. That's going to be our main text tonight. I'll be reading a little bit more text tonight than I normally would, but just got to say I'm very thankful to Brother Matt that he would share his pulpit with me. I haven't had an opportunity to preach since the last time I came here, so I think it's been maybe around four months, and I just want to do whatever the Lord calls me to do. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful for the grace of God. Amen. I'm thankful for the mercy of God. Amen. Because without the grace of God or the mercy of God, I wouldn't be up here. <laughs> I wouldn't be. I can't do it under my own power. Amen. Got to have the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, I feel like the, the people in the, the church, especially the modern church, uh, has decided in a large part to go their own way. To abandon the way that God has been trying to get his people to see. All through the Old Testament, the redemption plan of God, God has been revealing his plan to mankind, line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. And he's been revealing his, his plan that uh, the seed, which is Jesus Christ, uh, and the sacrifice, Amen. that he would sacrifice his life for us. He's been trying to get his people to see that. But I feel like in the large part, especially the modern church, has decide, decided to stiffen their neck, to harden their heart, and to abandon the cross and to go the opposite way, to go the Amen. wrong way, to, to abandon the plan of God, to abandon the will of God. The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned about to our own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Amen. You know, they're going the, the way of Cain instead of the way of Abel. Yes. And Satan, Satan has a plan too. That's right. Sad to say it. And his plan is working in a lot of the modern church. That's right. Because they've abandoned the plan of God. You know, Satan with the help of demonic spirits and fallen angels has been able to influence the preachers in the pulpit to go a different way to embrace another gospel and with another gospel comes another Jesus and with another Jesus comes another spirit and it's not the Holy Spirit it's not the spirit of the living God the modern church and many people even in the church and I believe this is a Philadelphia church this is a faithful church. Amen. Thankful for the man of God placed in the pulpit yes. here. Amen. That gets up here week after week and tells you the truth. Amen. Amen. The truth. But even though you attend a Philadelphia church, the faithful church, that doesn't mean that you can't be spiritually, spiritually clothed with the clothing of a Laodicean church. Just because you attend the church and the right message is preached doesn't mean that you have your faith completely in the plan of God, completely in Christ and Him crucified. And if we look to anything else other than Christ and Him crucified, you know what God sees? All He sees is fig leaves. It's fig leaves. Anytime we abandon the cross and go the opposite way, the modern church has clothed themselves with fig leaves. And I've come to minister a message to you titled, what are you clothed with? What are you clothed with? Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer real quick. Father, in Jesus' name, I just I want to thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to minister your word, Lord. Just anoint me, Lord. Anoint me with the Holy Spirit to preach and teach your word, Lord, that I wouldn't do any damage to it. I thank you, Lord, for opening the, the hearts and the ears of the people, that they will be able to hear it. That they will be able to receive it. That your word will edify us, Lord. That it would encourage us, Lord. And I ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Before I even get to the main text, I just really want to uh, run through a little bit of Genesis chapter 2. Just to pull out a couple brief points. You don't have to write all that down because you can read Genesis chapter 2 and get it. But the Bible says in Genesis 2, 7 that God formed man from the dust of the earth. And he breathed into him the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Bible says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? That soul, it matters to God. Yes. It's going to spend eternity in one of two places, heaven or hell. One of two places, heaven or hell.
But God planted a garden, the Bible says. He planted a garden eastward in Eden. And trees grew that were pleasant to the sight. They were good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. And there was a river that went out of Eden to water the garden. God took Adam and he put him into the garden to dress it. And to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man. He commanded him. It wasn't a suggestion. I want you to, to keep the garden. And hey, if you get time, I want you to do this. No, it says that the Lord God commanded the man. In the day that you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them to Adam and he named them. God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he pulled a rib from his side, and he made woman. In Genesis 2.25, it says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. This nakedness, they were literally naked, as in they didn't have clothes like we do, but it also suggests sinlessness. Adam and Eve, they were in swath, they were wrapped in. They were clothed with the light of God. They had nothing to be ashamed of. You know, you're ashamed whenever you sin because it makes you feel guilty. But they, they hadn't messed up at that point. At this point, they were pure, right? But how quickly things change from Genesis chapter 2 to Genesis chapter 3. And beginning reading that in uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, hath God said, You shall not eat? Of every tree of the garden? Right here, right off the bat, we see Satan calling the word of God into question. That's what, that's the, that's what he always wants. He calls the word of God into question. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So she quotes the command right back. So it's not like she had forgot. She didn't forget what it was. She quoted it right back to the serpent. And really Satan is using the serpent here, you know. Uh, and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So he went right there from questioning the word of God to denying the word of God. And that's what he wants to do. He will deny the word of God. But really now I feel like we're seeing a lot more of the word of God being perverted. You know, they got all these other new translations and they removed the word homosexuality. They removed the word sin out of it. That's, that's a perverted word of God. That's right. It says, For God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So he's promising them, what? That they could be like Elohim. You could be like God. You can be this wisdom that God has. You can have. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, got to stop there. That's a whole other message in itself. How many times as a Christian, whether you're Christian or not a Christian, the Bible says walk by faith, not by sight. But even as a Christian, your eyes can deceive you. We've got to watch what we look at. So it's pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together. They made themselves aprons, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, the woman, the woman who you gave to be with me. <laughs> she gave me the tree and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And skipping on down to verse 21, Until Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. So really the first thing I, I want to talk about is fig leaves. 
You know, Adam and Eve, they, they disobeyed the command of God. Sin came into the world. We all know that. They spiritually died instantly and would also physically die one day. You know, because Adam, we, we fell in Adam when he fell. Because it takes man's seed to procreate because he fell and his seed is passed on to a woman to have kids. Uh, we all fell with him. We all fell in him. Uh, the Bible says in Romans 3.23, it says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 5.12, it says as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for all have sinned. In verse 7, they sewed fig leaves together, together to, to cover their nakedness, to cover their sin. They made these fig leaf aprons with their own hands thinking they could cover themselves. But the Bible says in Hebrews that without the shedding of blood... There is no remission. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. There is no freedom. There is no liberty. Verse 8, when Adam and Eve heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. And when you, uh, you always hide from God when you're wearing fig leaves because you're afraid that it just isn't enough. It just isn't enough. Wearing fig leaves means you've manufactured your own way to cover your sins, to cover your nakedness. You know, fig leaves are anything that you place your faith in other than Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Any other way is a man-made way, and God cannot recognize it. You know, the sinners like to clothe themselves with religions, with sacraments, with religious ceremonies. And it's all, it's a false sense of security. They're as worthless as Adam's apron of fig leaves. Salvation by works. It's fig leaves. There's nothing we can do to earn our relationship with God. Amen. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for you are saved by grace through faith that not of yourself. It's a gift from God, Amen. not of works. Faith is a gift from God. Grace is a gift from God. Amen. Salvation is a gift Amen. from God. Praise I don't God. have to earn it. That's right. Jesus did it all for me. Amen. You know, we got to stop thinking that we got to go to the bargaining table with God for Him to love us. Right. How many times do we do that? Oh. We go to the bargaining table with God. I'm going to do this and this, Lord. And if you do this and this for me, Lord, if you do this and this for me, then I'll do this and this. Isaiah 64, 6, all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Your works before God is nothing more than filthy rags. You know, I think about when you, when you change the oil in your vehicle. If anyone does that in here, I still do mine sometimes. And I always have a rag on the side. And if I spill a little bit, I wipe it up. Would I clothe myself with that? And... I wouldn't even want my neighbor to see me looking like that. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't want to show up at church like that. But why would I put that on and try to go into the presence of the Lord? Why would I do that? You know, God said, Adam, where are you? Adam said he was afraid, so he hid himself from God. And that's what I want to ask you. Are you hiding from God this evening? You know, one of the best places for a sinner to hide is in a church pew. Because yeah. that sinner thinks... He's doing something for God, and he's right with God because of what he's doing. That's good preaching. Yeah. Romans 4, 2, it says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. You know, when God questioned Adam about how he knew he was naked, I want you to notice what Adam did in verse 12. The woman whom you gave me, she gave me of the fruit. So Adam blames God, and he blames the woman. You know, man never wants to own up to his mistakes. That's right. Amen. So he blames them on someone else. Amen. He did the same thing. She blamed the serpent, and in a way, she's blaming the serpent because God made the serpent. <laughs> but you know, salvation is about repenting. That's right. Confess your mess. Come on. Confess your mess. Hallelujah. I got to repent. And I'll just keep going the same way. When I repent, I turn and go the other way, the opposite way. Amen. We need to see ourselves as a sinner in need of a Savior. Amen. Genesis 3.15 
says, and I will put enmity, means hostility, animosity, hatred between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. What a great promise. Satan used the woman to bring down the human race. God will use the woman as an instrument to bring the Redeemer into the world. Amen. Verse 21, it says, God rushed in and he clothed Adam and Eve with the coats of skins. He didn't have to sleep on it. He didn't have to pray about it. Man, what am I going to do now? They done messed up the whole plan. He didn't sleep on it. He rushed in right away and he slew animals. Yes. And that animal it had nothing to do with Adam and Eve's sin. Amen. Jesus, he had nothing to do with our sin. Right. You know, it, the, the animal is just an innocent bystander. Yes. And let me tell you, sin has to be judged. Amen. And it's not a pretty picture. I believe God slew those animals in front of Adam and Eve and, and showed them what it looked like. That blood of that animal poured out all over the ground. Sin has got to be judged. You know, I think about that movie, The Passion of the Christ. I don't agree with everything in it, but I thought they did a pretty good job of probably showing how bad it really was. But honestly, it was worse because the Bible said that they pulled out his beard. They pulled his beard from his face. Sin being judged, it's, it's not a pretty picture. But right here, it means that God rushed in and he, <clears throat> he clothed Adam and Eve. It really shows us that the only covering we'll ever need comes from God. Man isn't God enough to cover a man. Man isn't God enough to cover a man. That's right. And you know, Brother Matt probably knows more about this than me, but I read something really not too long ago that there's, there's preachers out there that are asking another preacher, who's your covering? You ever heard of them? Who's your covering? And what they're expecting you to say is some specific preacher. But Adam couldn't cover his own backside. So why would I seek for some other man to cover me? Amen. I'm covered by the slain Lamb of God. Hallelujah. If somebody asks me, that's what I'm going to tell them. Amen, brother. Jesus Amen. died for me. Amen. He shed his blood for me. Yes. He was my substitute. Yes. He was our substitute. Amen. Who is your covering? But mankind and much of the church, they have chosen fig leaves. Fig leaves. They have gone their own way, a different way, an opposite way. But let me tell you something about a leaf. I've never seen a fig leaf with a fig hanging off the end. Mm. Have you ever seen Have you ever seen that before? Have you ever seen a, a leaf with a piece of fruit hanging off of it? Let me make it a little more simpler. Fruit don't grow from leaves. Come on, brother. Fruit doesn't grow from leaves. You have to be connected to the true vine. John 15, 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine. Yes. And I have to be in him. I have to be in Christ. And the Holy Spirit alone can bring forth fruit in our lives as, we, as long as we abide in Christ. So what I'm trying to tell you is if you clothe yourself with fig leaves, you're not going to see the fruit of the Spirit being produced in your life. Because your faith isn't completely in the plan of God totally exclusive, exclusively in faith, faith in Christ and Him crucified, but you're adding something to the work of God. You've clothed yourself with fig leaves, and we're not going to see love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. We're not going to see those things coming off of our life. Instead, we're going to see the works of the flesh. They're both in Galatians chapter 5, and if you're not seeing those, it's not, I don't know if I said fruits of the Spirit, but it's the fruit of the Spirit, but a good indication that you've clothed yourself with fig leaves and put together your own way is if you see the works of the flesh. Idolatry, fornication, emulation, heresy, all these things, uh, drunkenness. You know, I can't change you. You can't change you. I can't change me. You can't change me. But I know the one that can change all of us. Amen. And that's who I came to tell you about. Amen. And let me tell you this. When you pull a leaf off a tree, it turns brown, it shrivels up, and it dies. And that's a, a perfect picture of what our works are. You got to keep on pulling leaves. You got to keep on sewing them together. I ain't got but one big tree in my backyard, but I'm going to have to plant some more cheap trees if I plan to do that. 
as I gotta keep on pulling leaves, I gotta keep on sewing them together. I feel like a great example would be a hamster on a hamster wheel. That hamster runs and he runs and he runs. I don't care if he runs for five minutes. I don't care if he runs for an hour. Eventually he has, he has to get off that hamster wheel and he's still right where he started. Somebody said, I'm not a hamster, brother Matt. Okay, well, you can get on a treadmill. And you can run for an hour, a day, or a year. And eventually you're going to get off the treadmill and you're going to be right where you started. That's what works so it's a performance thing. You're just going in a circle, round and round, like that hamster on the wheel. And you're not going anywhere. Yeah. That's right. It's time for someone in here to pull the power plug on the treadmill of religious works. Because yeah. that's all it is, is a treadmill. It's just a performance thing. And I just can't perform enough. I can't. I can't earn it. I can't ride a bike to it. I can't run to it. God's not working through religion tonight. He's working through a relationship. God wants to visit his people. But he's not just looking for a visitation. He's looking for a habitation. He wants to live in you. That's right. There's a story in uh, Genesis chapter 4. It's a story of Cain and Abel. And we're not going to read it. I just I want to uh, just pull a couple points out of it. And in this story, you know, the seed of the woman met the seed of the serpent. You know, Abel was a, a keeper of sheep. Cain was a tiller of the ground. Cain brought fruit as an offering. Abel brought a firstling of his flock. God had respect to Abel and his offering, but didn't respect Cain and his offering. Abel's actions were righteous. Cain's were evil. Abel's altar, it speaks of repentance. It speaks of Faith, it speaks in, uh, of the precious blood of Christ, the Lamb of God without blemish. Cain's altar, it tells of pride. It tells of unbelief. It tells of self-righteousness. God has no respect for any proposed way of salvation. It's all about the sacrifice. Amen. The blood. There's no other way other than Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. I don't want to know any other message. Praise God. I don't want to know nothing else. I don't want to know about Buddha. I don't want to know about Confucianism. I don't want to know about any other way because the plan of God, the redemption plan of God, Christ and him crucified is the only way. Amen. Paul said, we preach Christ crucified Amen. to the Jews a stumbling block to the Greeks foolishness but Christ he's the wisdom of God he's the power of yes, God yes, the Bible says for the preaching of the cross that word preaching it's logos for the preaching of the cross for the word of the cross for yes. the message of the cross whatever way you choose to do it but in King James Version for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but unto us which are saved it's the power of God. The cross is the power of God. Has anyone in here ever experienced a miracle? Because if you say no and you're saved, then I'm sorry to tell you, but you're lying. Because the cross is the miracle working power of God that the Holy Spirit can rush in and perform a circumcision made without hands. And the Holy Spirit can move into me and live in me. Yes, Lord. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me in this life that I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. Yes. And he gave himself for me and for you. Yes. Go ahead and count me in on the able group. Mm -hmm. I'm one who looks to the sacrifice. Amen. Hope y'all can all say the same. Amen. Amen. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 through 21. I know we don't have the, the screens tonight, so I'll wait for y'all to turn there. You know, the last two churches spoken of, uh, the seven churches in Asia Minor, 
that Jesus uh, talked about, but the last two is the Philadelphia church and the Laodicean church. And again, the Philadelphia church is the faithful church. It's the church that preaches Christ and Him crucified. That's the only way. But the Laodicean church is the modern church. And in uh, Revelation 3, 15 through 21, we'll go ahead and read it. <clears throat> For I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that uh, thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. He said, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to, uh, I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with thyself that thou mayest see. Church of Laodicea is a, it's a, it's a picture of the modern church, you know. They want nothing to do with Jesus and the cross. Right there, uh, the white raiment, it speaks of, uh, it speaks, the raiment speaks of a clothing, of covering, the white holiness and righteousness. <clears throat> Amen. And you know, the Bible says that. Jesus, Jesus is on the outside of this church, and he's knocking on the door. They've, they've, they've shut him out. He's not, able, he's not in there, and I feel like the door is locked from the inside, and he's calling people. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man would hear my voice, I will come into him and sup with him, and he with me. I got a friend that was a, he was a preacher. Well, he, he still is a preacher, but he was preaching at a, a, another church not too long ago. And uh, they, if you started, you know, praying in tongues or anything like that, they would actually bring you and put you in a separate room. That's the kind of stuff that the modern church does. And it's a shame. I mean, I, I feel bad for them, you know. But if I came only to tell you about fig leaves, I wouldn't be preaching the whole gospel. Because God had a plan. Yeah. The Bible says that Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. That's right. That means before there was a Peter or a James or a John, before there was an Apostle Paul, before there was a King David or a King Solomon, before there was a Noah in the ark, before there was an Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees, yes. before there was a man or a woman on earth, before there was a heaven or earth that God had a plan yes. Hallelujah. that Hallelujah. he would create a man that man would fall into sin and that he would send his only son Jesus to die on the cross the redemption plan of God he already knew what was going to happen and he had a beautiful plan for us and I want to transition into talking about the blood we'll go to uh, Exodus chapter 12 verses 3 through 13 It says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. So we're going to take a lamb per house, and if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your account for the lamb. So it's a, it's a lamb per house. Your neighbors could come over if you didn't have enough in your house. But what it's saying there that everyone has to partake of the lamb that's in the house. Amen. You know, I can't ride my grandma's salvation. Amen. If the rapture of the church occurs, I can't tie a rope from me to Brother Matt and hope I make it up out of here. <laughs> do that. <laughs> People try to do that, but all of you all have to partake of the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take up the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house wherein they shall eat. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, <clears throat> and with bitter herbs they shall eat. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, <clears throat> but roast with fire, his head and with his legs, and with the pertness thereof. That's talking about the inwards. So they're pulling the inwards out, they're washing it, they're putting it back in, and then you're going to roast it. 
and you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. Don't let any of it remain. You can't partake in Jesus in, in stages. Not a little bit here and a little bit there. No, we got to partake in all of him. So you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning, you shall burn with fire, and thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, with your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, when I see fig leaves, when I see your own righteousness, no, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Amen. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So, <clears throat> basically to sum it up, you know, when it, when it was time for the children to leave Egypt, God told them to shed the blood of the land. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Go ahead and roast it. Eat all of it. Put your shoes on your feet. Get your rod in your hand. Because the moment that you paint that blood on the doorpost, you're coming up out of the world. You're coming up out of Egypt. Yeah. You're coming up out from under the dominion of Pharaoh, under the dominion of the devil. Yeah. And a New Testament Christian, when he paints the blood on the doorpost of his heart, God says, I will pass over you. And you're coming up out of that old life. So make sure your shoes are on your feet. And when you get to that Red Sea and you don't know where we're going to go, how are we going to get out of there? Pharaoh's coming. The devil's coming from behind. God will open up that Red Sea that was all about the blood. Yes. He'll open it up. He'll make a way for you. Amen. As long as you keep your faith in Christ and Him crucified. Amen. The Bible says that the, the water was a wall unto their left. And it was a wall unto their right. And they went through on dry ground. On dry land, you don't need hip boots. You don't need knee boots. Just keep on going. And God has made a, made a way for you. And it's all about the blood. Yeah. And I want you to see that the Egyptians, they were exposed to the judgment of God. Because they had no blood on the doorposts. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. When you put fig leaves on yourself, you're exposed to the judgment of God. But we're not exposed to the judgment of God tonight. If you painted the blood on the doorpost of your heart because the sin was judged on Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. The book of Leviticus, it speaks about the great day of atonement. You know, this was the one day a year that the high priest went into the Holy of Holies to offer up incense and speak, sprinkle blood on the mercy seat all for himself and the entirety of Israel. It dealt with the sins of the whole nation for 12 months. So the picture I've been trying to paint to get you to see that God has been revealing his plan to mankind about the sacrifice and Abel's lamb redeemed one man. The Passover lamb, one family. The Day of Atonement lamb, one nation. And upon the arrival of the ministry of Jesus, John the Baptist said in John 1.29, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Yes. He didn't just come to cover your sins. He came to yes. take them away. Yes. In the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 26 and 27. It says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For if you have been Baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. God no longer sees your unrighteousness, but He sees you clothed with the righteousness of Christ. The Bible speaks in John chapter 3 about being born again. You have to be born again. There was a ruler of the Jews, his name was Nicodemus, and he went to Jesus at night. He went to him at night, and I find that something 
that he went to him at night because you know what? He had a lot to lose. He probably could have lost his job, probably his family, his friends, all the money he had, the kingdom that he had done built. And he went to Jesus at night. And how many times do we just want to go to Jesus at night? Now, if you're seeking God and you're praying in your prayer closet, that's one thing. But we're not supposed to separate ourselves from the world. we got to show the world that there's a different way to go. Amen. And we don't just seek Jesus at night in our bed. When we're all by ourselves, where no one can see us. Worried about what friends we're going to lose, this and that. Jesus carried that cross up to Calvary, up to Golgotha, and he died on the top of a hill in front of the whole world for them to be able to see. Amen. And the Bible says that he spoiled principalities and powers, and he made a show of them openly, yes. and he triumphed over them in it. He stripped back the powers of darkness. Yes. Amen. The devil has no more dominion over you. God said, let my people go. You know, Jesus said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean up the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they're full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean up the inside of the cup and of the dish, then the outside of it can become pure. I'm talking about an inside job that needs to occur in being born again. Except you be born again, you cannot see, you cannot perceive, you cannot inherit, you cannot understand the things of the kingdom of God. But when you're born again, the Holy Spirit, He rushes in and He pulls you out of Adam and He places you into Christ 2,000 years ago. You came into union with Christ in His death, in His burial, in His resurrection. Romans 6, 3 through 6. I pray that you never get tired of Brother Matt talking about it because every time he gets up here, he says it. And it's, it's a basic of the message of the cross. I know it's hard on it. I've never talked to him before. I pray you don't get tired of hearing it. But I know he just wants to keep that Romans chapter 6 experience at the forefront of your Christian mind. Because the devil, he wants us to move us. He wants to move us away from the plan of God. And he goes over it with you over and over. And he just, he wants you to know the plan of God. Romans chapter 6 verse 3, it says, Know ye not that so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. We are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up by the glory of the Father, that, that we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this. Our old man, born of Adam, is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That from henceforth, from right now, from now on, we should not serve sin. For if you are dead, you are free from sin. Amen. It's a spiritual baptism that has to occur. And you know what? The moment that this happens, the, the sin nature is kicked off the throne of your heart. And I think about a punter when he punts a football. Boom, 60, 70 yards. It wasn't eradicated. I've talked to people before that tried to convince me that the sin nature was eradicated when Jesus died. The power that it had over you was broken, but it wasn't eradicated. It'll be eradicated, well, I guess when you die, you definitely don't have to worry about it no more. But when the king comes back and the rapture of the church occurs, that's when it's going to be eradicated because corruption is going to put on incorruption. Mortality is going to put on immortality. Amen. But that sin nature was kicked off the throne of your heart. And because of the exceedingly great and precious promises that we have, which is the word of God, we became partakers of the divine nature. Yeah. That's the nature of God. That's the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that sin nature is still in there, but it's no longer ruling and reigning like a king. Paul said, but when the commandment came, Sin revived and I died. So what I'm trying to tell you is you put your faith in Christ and Him crucified. And then all of a sudden you switch back to the fig leaves. Guess what? You might have a revival that you don't want. You might have a resurrection that you don't want. You might start seeing Him coming back up. The old man starts trying to come back up. The Romans 7 struggle. You get baptized into Christ. All of a sudden I feel like I can live for God because the Holy Spirit's in me helping me. I can live for God and... And do all these works and sanctify myself. 
But the moment you start, I already said that, we start putting our faith in the Lord many times, and you know what, we don't even realize it. It's so easy to start looking to rules and to laws and to regulations mm -hmm. to sanctify ourselves. But the same faith that brought me in, the, fa the same faith that brought me justification is the same faith that brings me sanctification. Mm -hmm. I can't sanctify myself. I'm instantly sanctified because I'm set apart for the uses that God intended me for. But sanctification is a lifelong process. I heard someone else say it like this before. Justification. Glorification. Sanctification. Because it lasts your whole, it lasts the rest of your life until, until you pass on. Amen. You know, Paul said, or, or, or rather, when we place our faith in the law, we frustrate the grace of God. Right. You got access to the grace of God. His grace is flowing to you. The Holy Spirit is the dispenser of grace. But the moment I look to anything other than Christ and Him crucified, I frustrate the grace of God. It's like, I think of it like this, it's like standing out in the rain, it's pouring down, you're getting soaked. But the moment I take that umbrella and flip it up, I'm no longer getting wet. The water's running all around me. And that's what happens when I, when I go back to the fig leaves. When I put my faith in anything other than exclusively Christ and Him crucified. Paul said, oh wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? But I thank God for Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah. He delivered me. He delivered you. Amen. You know, we can't live for God by our own willpower. Amen. We have to maintain our faith in Christ and Him crucified. And that is all. And the Bible says that sin shall not have dominion over you. Amen. It shall not have power over you. But the moment you trade the blood for fig leaves, sin will have dominion over you because it's not God's plan. It's the plan of man. You know, religion says, do, do, do. But faith says, rest, rest, rest. Because Jesus did it for me. Yeah. He did it all for me. All I have to do is place my faith in it. I don't have to work. I'm going to want to work. You're going to want to read your Bible more. You're going to want to pray more. Those are all good things. You're going to want to fast. Those are all good things. They, they, they're in the Bible. But we can't look to those things. We have to leave our faith in Christ and Him crucified. And that's all. Don't put your faith in your works. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, He said, It is finished it is finished he was on the cross and a cry came out he said Eli Eli lama sabachthani my God my God why have you forsaken me the father had, had turned his face he, he couldn't watch his son become the sin offering of the world and a short time later he gave up the whenever he said it is finished and he gave up the ghost and the Bible says that the veil that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies. It was ripped in two. It was ripped. And the historian Josephus said that thing was 60 feet tall. And it was four inches wide. Uh, thick. And that four yoke of oxen couldn't even pull that thing apart. And when Jesus died, it was ripped from the top all the way to the bottom. Not from the bottom to the top. Somebody, some Jew would have said, oh, man, then ripped that thing. And I got the knife out, cut through four inches thick, by 60 feet tall. No, it was ripped from top to bottom because God had ripped it. Because the way of access had been complete. You was no longer separated from God. You was no longer separated from the presence of God. That you could now come boldly into the throne room of the King of Kings, of the Lord of Lords, and tell Him exactly what you think you need. He already knows what you need, but you can walk in and tell him exactly what you think you need. And make sure that you thank him while he's there because he's just done so much in our lives. Amen. I'm talking about one sacrifice. Then he sat down at the right hand of God. He's our great high priest. I don't need an earthly priest anymore because he is our great high priest. Amen. And I can come boldly to the throne of grace because of what he did. Jesus said, come unto me, 
all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Yes. He'll give you rest. You don't have to labor for him to love you. Amen. You don't have to labor for it. You don't have to work for it. Just look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. I can't go without saying this. The Bible says for you are justified by your faith. You have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom also you have access by faith into this grace wherein I stand. When I put my faith in Christ and Him crucified, God says, justified, not guilty. Amen. Not guilty. I can't get up here without saying that. I got a couple people I talk to a lot of times that just tell me, man, I've been, I've been struggling this week and I know the person's faith is in Christ and Him crucified. The devil's trying to bring up my past. No, 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 no. I'm talking about a legal declaration over your life where God said, not guilty, innocent of all charges, righteousness placed <laughs> into your account, not because of what I do, but because of what I believe Amen. and who I believe in and what he did, yes. that we're not guilty. Amen. And I want to encourage you that if you have been putting on fig leaves, exposing yourself to the judgments of God, looking to anything other than Christ and him crucified. I mean, there's a, there's a sewage pipe running into the church now with all kind of false doctrine. And men are being blown about by every wind of doctrine that comes down the pipe from man. Amen. <clears throat> you don't have to work for this. Because if you're a member of the body of Christ, God already loves you. Your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. You've got a spot at the Father's table. Yeah. Colossians 3.3 3 says, For, uh, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ yeah. in God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Yeah. And you know, the question I want to ask you tonight is, uh, what are you wearing? <coughs> what are you wearing tonight? Spiritually speaking, we all call clothes, thank God. But what are, what are you wearing tonight? Are you wearing fig leaves? Or are you wearing the righteousness of Christ? What Jesus died to provide you with. I don't have to be exposed to the judgments of God anymore. Amen. And if you've been putting on fig leaves, I encourage you to take them off. Take that off. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to labor for it. Jesus did it all. He did it all. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You can go ahead and stand up. You can go ahead and uh, close your eyes. We just we'll seek the Lord for just a couple of short minutes. And like I said, if you decided to clothe yourself in fig leaves or you've been looking to anything other than Christ and Him crucified, I just, <clears throat> I encourage you to just place your faith in Christ and Him crucified. And that's it. That's all. I know I keep saying that, but that is the redemption plan of God. Ask the Lord to forgive you if you've been putting your faith in anything else.